I want to talk about Titan. The, the moon of Titan. I love I love our solar system. We, we're so lucky, you know. We, so, we are so lucky to have this planet in this distance from the, the, from, uh, the sun to have our moon to everything that we've got. And uh, it's 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 amazing that we still are discovering awesome stuff. Check this out. This is t this is the size of Titan. Just to give you just a, a little bit of a visual here. So this is Titan. Obviously, this is our moon. So in relation to our moon, it's it's bigger. It's almost twice the size as the moon, right? I would say that's about twice the size. Uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a fairly decent sized moon. Uh, there's a, uh, it's pretty cool. Saturn's moon, Titan, has a thick shell and bizarre interior. And you can actually see a cross section. It looks like there's an underwater or underground ocean. And now we discussed an under the underwater ocean on uh, Enceladus last week, which is very cool, which I fully believe there's going to be um, some sort of life there. But that's another story, another story. If you missed it, you could check it out on my channel. So... The tough, icy shell of Saturn's largest moon, Titan, is apparently far stronger than previously thought. These surprising new findings adds to hints Titan possessed an extraordinary, bizarre ex uh, interior. Past research suggested Titan has an ocean hinder hidden under its outer icy shell 30 to 120 miles thick. Investigations aim to explore this underground ocean in hopes of finding alien life on Titan. Since virtually wherever there is water on Earth, there is life. Now, going back to uh, Enceladus and the fact that we think that there's underwater thermal vents, and we know that at the thermal vents at the bottom of our oceans, there is bacteria that feeds on the energy that comes out of those vents. They don't require energy from the sun, which is most life on this planet requires. Plants take in the sunlight, they convert it to sugars, and... Uh, proteins and then animals eat that and then some animals eat the animals some animals just need can eat the plants and whatever it's the cycle of life right but we've now found that there's bacteria on earth that doesn't actually require sunlight now this is what i'm talking about so if if there's a an ocean under there and if there is a molten core they think that there's a molten core in enceladus uh, I, I don't know if it's actually proven yet, but it would make sense because there are geysers that shoot out from Enceladus. Now, obviously, we're talking about Titan now, but the fact that they're talking about life in in this ocean, because look, you can see this cross section that there is an ocean down there. We don't know what kind of ocean it is, but it's very cool, very exciting. So to learn more about Tyson's Titan's icy shell, planetary scientist Doug Hemingway at the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, analyzed the Cassini probe scan of Titan's gravity field. The strength of the gravitational pull at any point on the surface exerts depends on the amount of mass underneath it. The stronger the pull, the more the mass. A rigid ice shell on Saturn's large, largest moon, Titan, resists the upward pressure of the buoyant root, whose low density produces a negative gravity anomaly. Upward deflection of the ice shell creates positive topography but surface weathering keeps that topography small this is a, an image of exactly oh, exactly that surface weathering there it is interesting interesting the researchers then compared these gravitation uh, gravity results with the structure of titan's surface they expected that the regions of high elevation would have the strongest gravitational pull since one might suppose that they had extra matter underneath them Conversely, they expected regions of low elevation would have the weakest gravitational pull. When the investigation discovered, or what the investigators discovered shocked them. The regions with the highest elevation on Titan had the weakest gravitational pull. It was very surprising to see that, Hemingway told Space.com. They assumed at first that we got things wrong, that we were seeing the, backwards, or the data backwards. And after we ran out of options to make that finding go away, we came up with a model that explains these observations. To explain the gravi gravity anomalies, Hemingway said to imagine mountains on Titan having roots. It's like how most of an iceberg actually lies submerged underwater. He said, if that root is really big, bigger than normal, it would displace water underneath it. Ice has a lower density than water. A, a chunk of ice weighs less than similar volume of water. 
These high elevation areas on Titan apparently have roots large enough to displace a lot of water underneath them, meaning they exert a weaker gravitational pull. Ice is buoyant in water. In order to essentially hold these big icebergs down and keep them from bobbing up, that means Titan's shell has to be extremely rigid, Hemingway said. It remains uncertain what makes Titan's shell this rigid. The ice might possess cage-like molecules known as uh, catharates uh, that could, uh, excuse me, clatherates that could make it stiffer. Also, if the ocean underneath the shell is colder than before thought, that can make the ice shell thicker and thus more rigid. Rigid. This rigidity could mean Titan's shell is less geologically active than once thought. If at least the top 40 kilometers or 25 miles is very stiff and cold and dead, you want something like cryovolcanoes that erupt water instead of lava on Titan's surface. You have to be more creative about how that might happen. Their models also suggest Titan's shell has seen an extensive amount of erosion, with features carved more than 650 feet deep into its surface. We now need different groups of people to figure out how much material could get broken up and transported along distances across Titan's surface. This is all from Hemingway here. One implication of these new findings relates to whether or not Titan's interior is separated into distinct layers. If researchers have underestimated Titan's gravity field, one might suspect its core is a giant blob of matter that is not made up of distinct layers as one would expect from such a large body. For instance, Earth is separated into a crust, mantle, and core. And even large asteroids, such as Vesta, seem to have interiors divided into several layers. Maybe Titan is a mixture of ice and rock from the core nearly all the way out, and it's only in the last part near its surface that it's differentiated into ice and water, Hemingway said, but we could be wrong there. To help solve this mystery, what we need is a Titan orbiter. That way, we can have much better readings of Titan and learn more about its shell and its interior. This is all from Hemingway. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Now, they're talking about a probe, okay, that could actually land on Titan and get some samples and leave using propellants from Titan. Check this out. So, this is from NASA, okay? A Titan sample return using in situ propellants. A Titan sample uh, return using in situ propellants is as proposed. Titan sample return mission using in situ volatile propellants available on its surface. This approach from for Titan is a very different from all conventional in situ resource utilization concepts and will accomplish a return of a great science value towards planetary science, astrobiology, pardon me, and understanding the origin of life. That is an order of magnitude more difficult than other sample return missions. Well, that is an understatement. Let me pop this picture up. This is cool. This is basically the um, art rendering of what they're talking about. I actually have an article that kind of goes more into, into details here. With all the excitement about current Mars missions, one might also forget that we have a solar system full of fascinating worlds to visit. Well, you got that right. Take Titan. It is Saturn's largest moon, and it's the only moon known to have a dense atmosphere, making it a mysterious place. In addition to its unique atmosphere, Titan is also the only body in the solar system to have stable lakes and seas. Not filled with water, though, with liquid ethane and methane. What do you do with uh, methane and ethane? Flammable. Yes, indeed. As you can imagine, there are many questions regarding Titan scientists that would like to see answered. NASA has a program called the NASA In uh, Innovative Advanced Concepts, through which it postulates an amazing and unconventional idea for a future sample return mission to Titan where a spacecraft would refuel on location using Titan's natural resources. In this article, Matt Williams explains such a mission, what it would look like. This decade promises to be, well, I'm going to skip that one because uh, here we go. So currently they are planning it. That's the one I actually just showed you. And uh, that could fuel up using the liquid methane harvested from Titan's surface. Okay, the mission would present some serious advantages over conventional sample return. Ordinarily, missions 
to distant celestial objects either need to bring it along enough propellant for the return trip, which is obviously a lot of high cost and added mass, or have a nuclear battery that can provide power for several years, which is actually what the Perseverance has. It's nuclear powered, very cool. So the Dragonfly mission, which is scheduled to launch 2027 and arrive at Titan in 2036, will spend 2.7 years exploring Titan as part of its uh, primary mission. In order to operate so far from home, it will rely on a multiple mission uh, radioisotope thermal electric generator, MMRTG, where the heat caused by the slow radioactive decay of plutonium generates electricity. Meanwhile, the sample return concept would provide fuel for its return flight using volatile elements harvested from Titan's surface. As you can see from the illustration at the top, it would consist of a lander and an ascent vehicle, which for some reason, I'm not getting any images here, but I can only imagine that this is what they're talking about here. So this is this would be like the platform where everything happens. This is their, you know, flying around, scout, whatever. And then this is the return trip. So, so using the resources harvested in situ, the lander could provide liquid methane and liquid oxygen fuel created from the local ice for the ascent vehicle. This vehicle would then be loaded up with samples collected by Dragonfly and carry them back to Earth. Not, or by not transporting its own propellant, the sample return element of the mission would have a lower overall mass and therefore would cost less to launch. On top of that, the sample return mission would exponentially increase the scientific returns of the Titan mission. For years, scientists have been hoping to get a better look at the moon's surface uh, to investigate its particular mysteries. Those include, but are not limited to, its dense nitrogen-rich atmosphere, its hydrological cycle, but with methane, and rich organic chemistry and prebiotic conditions on its surface. So. And it goes into a lot more scientific mumbo jumbo there. I don't think I can even pronounce half of the things that they go over there. Uh, it was difficult enough to understand what they were talking about, but it was it was very cool. The fact that we are actually planning on going to Titan. This is this isn't just some uh, space age vision. They are making this happen. They are talking about it. They are going. It leaves 2027. That means we're going to have a man-made object roaming around on Titan in the next 15 years. In in 15 years, if everything obviously goes correctly. And, uh, and it makes it. So, if it makes it, I'm excited to see it. We'll see, I see a lot of people in chat saying uh, the Mars landing perseverance is fake. You can believe what you want. I believe we landed there. And uh, we're, we're moving towards a space future. It, it's going to happen. It, it's going to happen.